Recorded Books is pleased to present the Modern Scholar Series, where great professors teach you. Today we begin a course entitled Medieval Mysteries, the History Behind the Myths of Middle Ages. Your professor will be Thomas F. Madden. Thomas F. Madden is Professor of History and Director of the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at St. Louis University. His numerous publications include The Concise History of the Crusades, Roman and Littlefield, 2013, Venice, A New History, Viking, 2012, Empires of Trust, Viking, 2008, Enrico Dandolo and the Rise of Venice, Johns Hopkins University Press, 2003, and The Fourth Crusade, University of Pennsylvania Press, 1997. He is a recognized expert on pre-modern history, appearing in such venues as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, and the History Channel. His scholarly awards include the Haskins Medal of the Medieval Academy of America and the Otto Grundler Prize of the Medieval Institute. He is a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and a fellow of the Medieval Academy of America. Lecture 4. Burn Them All, Witches and Inquisitors in the Middle Ages. In this lecture, we're going to look at the myth and legends of the Inquisition and witches in the Middle Ages. Oftentimes when people think about the Middle Ages, one of the things they think first of is dungeons and torture devices. All of these things that were used to either punish criminals or those who had committed treason or uh, heretics and many of these devices used to force people to convert to Catholicism. You can think of, for example, to use a modern example, Mel Brooks' movie, History of the World, Part 1, in which he has the Inquisition with all of its torture devices, the rack and the Iron Maiden, and all sorts of various uh, devices uh, used on Jews to force them to convert to Catholicism. And the same thing uh, with witch trials, too, during the Middle Ages. To look at another comedy movie, uh, and comedy often tells us the most about what we think about things, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, in which you have a witch trial, in which a woman is brought before the local uh, magistrate or a wise man, and uh, she's accused of being a witch. And uh, various forms of evidence are used against her, uh, like she has a long nose, which is actually a fake nose, and that she turns someone into a newt who is standing right there. And the, the mob, of course, demands uh, that she be burned. As far as witchcraft goes, and let's take that first because it's the easiest, witchcraft of the sort that is referred to in Monty Python in any case was virtually unknown in the Middle Ages. The whole trope of having a long nose and a hat and the rest, those are all modern representations. By modern, I mean 16th and 17th century representations of uh, witches. Um, they have nothing to do with the Middle Ages. In truth, witchcraft always has existed, if by witchcraft we mean some kinds of various charms or incantations or superstitious behavior of that sort. These kinds of things certainly existed in the Middle Ages. There's no doubt about it. But there was no class of people who would have considered themselves to be a witch. And there was no real concern in the Middle Ages that we can find any evidence of that people were worried about these kind of people who were witches. Witchcraft, as it was understood later in the 16th century, meant someone who was actually doing black magic, who was performing rituals uh, and causing curses and other kinds of magic to occur because of a consortium with demons and, and devils. That type of thing was, there was no real consideration of that at all in the Middle Ages. The only kind of magic that would have existed in the Middle Ages was the kind of uh, superstitious behavior. And in fact, some cases, it would be superstitious behavior that would be kind of built onto sacramentals or religious aspects. For example, um, in some magical practices, people would try to get hold of a host, the communion wafer, from church, and then they would use it by inscribing a name on it or putting it in various places in their house to cause certain things to happen because they believed it had that kind of power. It became a real problem, uh, so much so that the church began ensuring 
that the communion wafer only be placed on the tongue of the person who was receiving communion so that the priest could watch them consume it, so they wouldn't be able to take it someplace and use it for something. So that kind of witchcraft was not really a concern in the Middle Ages. It was certainly not a crime that was known about. And the Inquisition, the medieval Inquisition, uh, was not concerned with it. So it's fairly simple to take care of that issue in any case. There were no witches, the kind of witches that we think about either from the Monty Python movie or from later periods. Now, there were witch trials. There were lots of people brought uh, on charges of witchcraft, and they were burned at the stake and or killed in other ways. But none of those things happened in the Middle Ages. Uh, they happened instead in the Renaissance. These were mostly things which occurred in the 16th and 17th centuries, and these mostly occurred in Protestant countries. The majority of the witch trials occurred in Germany or in uh, Northern Europe, or, as we all know, uh, a few even in British North America, as in the Salem witch trials. So, if there were no witches, then what was the purpose of the Inquisition? Now, there was an Inquisition in the Middle Ages, but it was not looking for witches. It was instead looking for what everyone was concerned about, and that was heresy. People didn't worry so much about whether there was a witch in their midst, because they didn't have a clear idea of what that would have been anyway, but they understood what a heretic was. Heresy, in other words, denying the truth of the Catholic faith, was a capital offense. It was a capital offense by all secular rulers in Europe. In other words, it was a crime against the monarch. It was not a crime against the church. The church did not have laws in which people could be executed for not being Catholic. It was the monarchs who had those kinds of laws. The reason for that was that the monarch's authority was given to them by God through the church. To question the Catholic religion and to question the truth of Catholicism and the church was to question the authority of the king. It was, in other words, treason. It also was enormously worrisome for everyone who knew a heretic. And heretics were extremely rare, I should say, in the Middle Ages. But when they existed, people were very, very afraid of them because their heresy not only doomed them to eternal damnation, but it tore apart the whole fabric of society. Remember, almost everyone in the Middle Ages, except for Jews, was Catholic. It tore apart the one thing that bound everyone together. And it threatened the health and the well-being of all those around them because it threatened to bring down divine judgment. It was kind of like a treason and a deadly contagious disease all rolled up into one. And therefore, both secular lords and local mobs were very, very energetic about making sure that heresy did not continue to exist in their communities. So, if that was the case, how did the Inquisition deal with it? Well, the first thing to know is that there was no Inquisition uh, before the 12th century. The Inquisition was not created first and then went after heretics, but rather heresy became a problem, and then the Inquisition was developed to deal with that. Heresy was dealt with in the Middle Ages. When it popped up, it was dealt with on a fairly ad hoc basis. The heretic, let's say in the 10th century or so, a heretic who was uh, accused of being a heretic would be rounded up usually by people in his community, and because it was a crime against the king or the monarch or the noble in that region, that heretic would then be brought to the local lord who would sit in his seat of judgment. And he would judge that heretic the same way that you would judge somebody to dis discern whether they stole a pig. And he would then dis pass judgment on whether the person was indeed a heretic or not. And therefore, he would make a uh, decision. Most of the time these nobles would decide, well, most of the time these nobles knew nothing at all about whether what the person was saying was heresy or not. The theological understanding of your local noble was seriously deficient. And therefore, just to be safe, you would often get nobles uh, or lords who would just simply decide to burn them anyway, just to make sure, just in case what they believe is heresy. It was a lucky heretic uh, who happened to get in front of a bishop 
or another churchman, because if a bishop or a churchman was there, they were instructed to try to persuade the heretic to change their mind. The churchman did not seek out heretics, and the highest penalty that the church had was excommunication. In general, and we see this in the writings of the church in the 10th century and in the 11th century, churchmen knew that times had been hard and that there were a lot of people who were Christians who just didn't know the faith very well. Um, and so the reform movements in the 11th century put the emphasis on preaching and on pastoral care, and on trying to educate people about the faith and on trying to make it so that they understood what they had not been taught. It was only in the late 12th century that you started to get some heretics who were not just misinformed, but who were truly heretics, who knew what the faith of the church was and actively rejected it. And these are the ones uh, who start to go underground. We'll talk about those in a moment. So how does the Inquisition get started? Well, after the peace in Venice in 1177, this was a peace that brought together the Pope and the Emperor uh, after a long war between the two. Both uh, the German Emperor and the Pope came to the conclusion that they really needed to find a way to deal with the problems of heresy as it was developing and how it was being dealt with. And so in 1184, Pope Lucius III issued a uh, encyclical ad abolendum in which he refers to heretics. He's talking about heretics here who are obstinate heretics, saying that their crime is a defiance of authority and a prideful refusal to accept the truth. He then orders bishops in all of the dioceses to have control over the inquiry into whether someone is a heretic or not. Their job that he gives them is to investigate the charge of heresy. He tells them to use good Roman law methods. In other words, people of good reputation should be sworn in. They should examine the evidence as to whether someone is in fact a heretic. The basic system, however, remains the same. There should be no proactive seeking out of heretics. Someone would have to actually be accused. And then once that person was going to be brought before the courts, they must have evidence used against them to demonstrate, in fact, that they are, in fact, heretics. What he was doing and what the creation of the Inquisition was, was an attempt to try to inject the church into what was before a purely secular legal situation. In other words, when a heretic was accused and brought before the local lord, that lord made a decision and effected a penalty because it was a crime against the state. What Pope Lucius III is doing, and what churchmen would do afterwards, is say, if someone is being declared a heretic, that is a judgment that must be made by people who actually know the faith. And therefore, the local bishop must assign people who are knowledgeable in the faith and who are knowledgeable in Roman law to be able to investigate the charge before the trial, to inquire into the charge. And that's where the term inquisition comes from, to question. And in fact, we use the same method in our own courts. We just call it an inquest um, because people don't like the term inquisition. The Inquisition then would look into the charge and would speak to the accused and to speak to other witnesses to dis discern whether the person was actually a heretic or was simply someone who did not know the faith and therefore simply had gone astray. The reason for this was not only to keep people from being unjustly executed, but it was also to put the church in a position so that if someone had gone astray, uh, from the faith and was accused of it, this would provide the churchmen there the opportunity to bring them back into the fold, to say, are you sorry that this happened? Are you willing to recant those errors? Are you willing to come back to the faith? In other words, it gave them, as shepherds of the flock of Christ, the ability to try to bring the wayward sheep back without just having them thrown onto the fires. The odd thing about the medieval inquisition, therefore, is not that it was something that was created to force people into being Catholics. It was actually something that was created to put reason into what had become a very irrational legal system. It was created, in fact, to save lives and to save souls. The purpose was to inject the church between the accused and the state. 
and to try to find a way to keep that person who was accused out of the fire. If, however, you had in this, uh, someone who was absolutely a, a heretic and who refused to change their mind, then the Inquisition would simply define them as heretics, and then they would be handed over to the secular courts. And then the secular courts, with that judgment from the Inquisition, um, had no qualms about burning them at the stake. Now, what are these heretics that they're looking for? Um, there's a variety of them, but uh, the biggest of the heresies in the Middle Ages that the Inquisitions are dealing with is the Cathar heresy. So just a, a bit about that, because that in itself has led to a lot of mythology about the Middle Ages. Catharism was a dualist heresy. It came out of earlier heresies, particularly Manichaeism and Bogomilism, and it took root in southern France. It was always a very small minority of the people who lived in southern France uh, in the Middle Ages, but it became a particularly well-organized heresy and one that caused a lot of problems. The basic idea of the heresy was that the universe was itself a kind of a battleground between a good god and an evil god. Uh, Yahweh was the good god. Uh, he made the universe of spirit. And Jehovah, who was the god of the Old Testament, was the evil god. He had created the world and the material world and all that was in it. And the battle was between matter, which was evil, and spirit, which was good. And throughout the history of the universe, um, the evil god would trap spirits, souls, into bodies and would put them onto the earth. And our job in life, then, is to achieve perfection. And when you achieve perfection, you will then transcend this physical matter world, and you will go back to the spiritual world. And if you don't do it in one life, you are reborn over and over again. Now, Catharism naturally was very hostile to the Catholic Church. Cathars believed that Jesus, when he came, was a, a phantom. Uh, he was not physical, and that he preached this truth about the need to essentially live a very ascetic lives, one where you reduce your matter so you reduce your matter by eating much less, so you become very skinny. Um, you don't reproduce because that will just trap another soul. And the Catholic Church, which was created by the evil God, uh, the Catholic Church then changed Jesus' message completely, and they said that he was physical and that he had actually died and resurrected, and that he had created the mass in which he physically is present in the body, his body and blood, under the species of bread and wine. So this was naturally a problem. And the Inquisition, which had originally been created to deal with, for the most part, wayward uh, heretics, those who had just simply stumbled into a heresy, had to start dealing with a new heretics in the late 12th and into the 13th century, these Cathars, who had not stumbled into it at all. They were very uh, strongly uh, opposed to the Catholic Church, and they were also underground. They were trying to hide the fact that they were Cathars. And the Inquisition, therefore, uh, was dealing with that. The Inquisition that we think of then, today, of torture chambers and the rack and all of that, didn't really exist in the way that we think of it. Initially, it was done on a very local level by bishops and legal professionals, those who were trained in Roman law and theology. Eventually, it would be centralized more in the 13th century, um, the popes began trying to bring the Inquisition into more of a centralized approach. So, for example, in 1231, Pope Gregory IX sent a letter to the prior of the Dominican convent in Regensburg, commissioning him as a judge delegate to travel wherever and to preach and to seek out heretics. And he told him that he could appoint others to do the same thing. And this is really the beginning of the Pope using the new mendicant orders. These are the Dominicans and the Franciscans, who were highly trained in theology, particularly the Dominicans. And the Dominicans would henceforth become very, very closely connected with the Inquisition. Being Inquisitor, then, after this period, becomes an office. You were answerable only to the Pope, and you could go from place to place, seeking out these heretics, making sure that the spiritual health of these various communities uh, was strong. Uh, and in fact, inquisitors' manuals start to be written in the 14th century, most notably by uh, Bernard Guy, who is referenced in the, uh, uh, the Name of the Rose, both the movie and the book, although he was not at all like he was in those portrayals of him. How did the medieval inquisition work? Well, it basically worked along 
established Roman legal procedures. It used all the basic methods of a, whether you needed an accuser or simply a denunciation um, by infamy. It was not a criminal trial, so the accused in the Inquisition could not be punished, although a penance could be prescribed if the person was guilty and they asked for forgiveness. Usually there were two inquisitors whenever the Inquisition would come, and they would then have legal experts and armed retainers and all of that. If the Inquisition came to a town in the 13th century, they would call the clergy and the people together for a sermon. At that sermon, they'd give their credentials. Um, they would remind people of the tenets of the faith. And then they would urge all those who were Orthodox in their beliefs to identify to them any known heretics or people they suspected of heresy. These are the kinds of methods that they developed in the 13th century to try to find these hidden heretics now, like the Cathars. Then they would announce uh, a period of grace, and anyone who confessed that they were a heretic would be absolved, and they would be allowed to go free. There'd be no consequences. Also during this time, they would begin accepting denunciations. So if you knew your neighbor was a heretic, this was the time to, to say. The suspects were then brought before the inquisitors after the time of grace had passed, and they would be questioned. The manuals, um, which still survive, were emphatic that you had to use established legal procedures. They, the accused had to be given a defense. It was not unlike modern trials. One difference, however, was that witnesses were to be kept secret. Um, this was to protect against any reprisals and probably also to protect their sources. What about torture? Now, here we come to the other thing about the, the dungeons, is the, the torture that was used in them. Torture in the Middle Ages and in the ancient world had two different functions. One, torture could be used by anyone who with a dungeon or a back room to torture their enemies or to torture people they didn't like. Human beings are, are awfully good at coming up with ways to torture each other. And that sort of torture, of course, existed in the Middle Ages as it exists today and has existed throughout human history. But the torture that was associated with the Inquisition was a different sort of torture. This was the torture as a judicial instrument. And this comes directly from Roman law. In Roman law, torture could be used in certain fairly rare cases, but it could be used in capital offenses in those cases in which witnesses or the accused had information that they were refusing to divulge. Or there was very good reason to believe that someone was lying. In those cases, torture could be applied in order to get to the truth. Now, this, of course, poses its own problems, that the person who's being tortured might just say whatever you wanted um, them to say. And so th that's why in the ancient Roman case and in the medieval case, they were very careful to make it clear that there was no right answer to this. The purpose of the torture was simply that there was good reason to believe you have information that you are not giving us or you're giving us false information. The torture in this case had to be done in a way that was short. It could never be more than 10 or 15 minutes, and that could not cause any permanent harm. And then, thirdly, whatever someone said under torture, they would then have to repeat without torture. And in the Roman law case, and also the Inquisition is based on Roman law, if a person afterwards said, well, I just said that because I was under torture, then they could be tortured only one more time. Uh, and again, with the same rules. Uh, and then if they, again, after the second torture said, I disavow what I said under torture, then that was the end of it. The purpose of the torture in, as a judicial instrument was not simply to cause pain, uh, although that's what it did. The purpose was to find the truth. And the reason for this was that in the ancient world and in the medieval world, in these kinds of judgments, and I should say the torture was not used just in the Inquisition, it was used in all courts, no matter what the crime was. But the reason that they used this was they cared about the truth. They wanted justice to be done, and they wanted to find out what the truth was. In our world, we don't use torture, obviously, as a judicial instrument. The reason is, is because in our world, we're much more concerned about individual rights. We accept that very guilty people will go free because we want to preserve individual rights. We accept that you might have a number of witnesses who all 
give different testimonies and it's clear that someone is lying, and we accept that and recognize that we may not get to the truth here at all in a court case because we would rather preserve individual rights than actually get to that truth. So in the modern world, we're more concerned about protecting individual rights and liberty than we are about the justice of the court. In the ancient pre-modern world, that was not the case. They were more concerned about justice. They were more concerned about finding out the truth. What was the torture? What was torture like that they were doing in these inquisitions? Well, it wouldn't make very good movie fodder. To be honest, uh, the tortures that the Inquisition dealt with, it's clear from the, the Inquisition manuals that they were felt fairly um, uncomfortable with the idea of torture, so it was done only very rarely. And when it was done, it was done in almost a half-hearted manner. One of the more common methods of torture, by the Inquisition at least, was to simply use a rope. Your hands would be tied behind your back. The rope would then be thrown over a, a rafter or a beam, and then it would be pulled. And so your arms would be pulled up from the rope. This would be fairly painful uh, because it would pull on the sockets of the shoulder. If you pulled hard enough, you could dislocate both of the shoulders, but it would not cause any permanent harm. It would cause certainly a, a lot of pain, uh, but it wouldn't cause any permanent harm. It was also a very cheap and easy uh, way to apply pain, and also had the benefit of increasing the pain the more pressure that you put onto it, um, and therefore you were able to kind of ratchet the pain up or down based on the questioning. So when they did torture, the rare times that they did, that tended to be the one that they did. But what about all the other torture devices? All of those various kinds of torture devices that you'll see, for example, if you go to uh, museums in London or, or in uh, Germany, Things like uh, the Iron Maiden and the, uh, the Judas Chair, which was a giant kind of pyramid in which you lowered people down onto that they sat on, and it, it basically slowly impaled them. Or all of those other torture devices that you see in, in museums or, or in movies. The fact is, almost all of them are early modern. They're devices that were developed in the rationalism of the late Renaissance and uh, Enlightenment periods. In other words, they're devices that were supposed to demonstrate that reason can torture far more effectively than can the stupid Middle Ages. Uh, so things like the Iron Maiden, the Judas Chair, were never used in uh, the Middle Ages. Um, they were used in the Renaissance um, and in the Enlightenment. The rack uh, which is another one of the usual pieces of furniture that you would expect to find in a medieval dungeon. Um, there's some evidence that it may have been used in England during the Middle Ages, some conflicting evidence that it may have been used in some cases there. But if it was used at all, very often it was used much more in the Renaissance. So these kinds of uh, devices, these kinds of uh, torture devices that you will often see, as I say, in museums, the worst museums will claim that these are actually medieval instruments of torture, are not medieval at all. Um, they're usually 16th, 17th uh, century uh, devices, and some of them are just simply fakes made in the, in the 19th century. Getting back to the Inquisition, everything in these trials was recorded in writing, which is one of the reasons why uh, historians have worked so much on the Inquisition and why we know so much about it. If the suspect was found guilty of heresy then, he or she could recant uh, their heresy. Um, they would have to promise never to go back to the heresy, and then they would also have to help to identify any other heretics, particularly if they were underground heresy like Catharism. And then they would accept a penance. Now remember, this is somebody who um, refused to come forward that they were a heretic, had been demonstrated that they were in fact a heretic, and had been found guilty of heresy. Then, if they were willing to recant, to avoid having to go to the secular courts, they could do that and they could accept a penance. This penance could be fasting or prayer or a pilgrimage or um, wearing of a yellow cross for a while. Really bad heretics or what they called heresy arcs, the leaders of heretics who repented would be imprisoned so that they would not spread this any longer. Heretics who refused to recant, who were found guilty and who refused to recant, or those who had previously recanted and then were found to be guilty again, in other words, they were relapsed heretics, 
At that point, you would have what was called the relaxing to the secular arm. In other words, the only thing that was keeping these people from being in the secular courts was the Inquisition. And therefore, if you're found guilty by the Inquisition, and if you refuse to recant your error, then the Inquisition would simply step aside. And that way, the person would go directly to the state. The state would then confiscate their property and usually burn them. Then finally, the Inquisition, the medieval Inquisition, would end with a big public ritual. Everyone would come out. There would be kind of a statement of the purification of the town. Any heretics that were found would be proclaimed, and there'd be a big celebration. It may seem strange to us today, but people actually looked forward to the Inquisition coming to their town. And the few instances that we have of there being uprisings when Inquisitors came were because people believed the Inquisitors were not taking their job seriously, that they were letting heretics off. As I say, heresy was serious business in the Middle Ages, and the Inquisition, therefore, was the means to deal with what today we would consider to be like an infectious disease. These were, as they called themselves, the doctors of souls, and they were there to purify and to heal.